without further ado, I'm going to pass it on over to Dr. Krogstad for an introduction and then to go into RSP for LA County. Okay. Um, good afternoon. I hope everyone can see my slides well and can hear me well. Um, I'm going to start um, by, it, it occurred to me that nowhere uh, in this do I have a specific explanation for uh, how this virus, um, respiratory syncytial virus, gets its name. And the, the syncytial just refers to when you're looking in a microscope at, how, at the virus growing, the, uh, an appearance that you get, uh, something called a syncytium. But um, it is way too many syllables for polite conversation, for easy conversation. So RSV is what I will always use, and that's uh, in, um, uh, it is unusual to actually hear a physician or a scientist spell, uh, use the full name when RSV will do. Now, I, I wonder if, if, if I had chat, um, I wonder if um, uh, in pictures of all of you or I had set up a poll, how many of you would say that you had heard of RSV before? And as soon as I can get this to advance, I'll advance to my next slide. Um, there we go. Um, but those of you who, have, who may have uh, had some knowledge of RSV are probably used to thinking, as most physicians are, that this is a disease of, of childhood. Here, for example, is uh, the, a scenario that jumps to mind for many pediatricians. When you, uh, um, you envision a child who typically is under the age of six months, uh, often premature, who encounters RSV and doesn't do well with it. Um, as you see, the same uh, seven-month-old infant pictured on the left is a month later now depicted in an intensive care unit in Oregon um, with uh, connected to a ventilator via the large plastic tube that's supporting his breathing and the uh, IV tubing here and there from various sources. So uh, this indeed can be a very uh, difficult um, um, health challenge for the youngest of infants. However, um, there, there's much more to it than that. And here, here's the topics that I plan on discussing. I wanna give you an understanding what RSV is and how um, it has been an annual public health threat for decades. I wanna give you some sense of the severity of it and how it's different from influenza, the flu, and COVID-19. Um, I'll provide a, dis a discussion of strategies for preventing uh, children and adults from getting RSV and how it's treated at home and uh, a few words about how it's treated in the hospital as well. Finally, and apropos for this audience, I'll discuss means for supporting families and young children and, uh, and infants who um, are dealing with the, in, the problems that come with being infected with this virus. I want to say outright that I have no financial conflicts of interest to report um, as a speaker on this topic. I want to make sure that we begin with a, a bit of a terminology slide, because you probably hear in the news just a mention of this is an upper respiratory tract infection, and this uh, the lower respiratory tract infections are different. The upper or the respiratory tract is defined as that part of our body through which air passages uh, passes for the purposes of extracting oxygen and relieving ourselves of some of the carbon dioxide that we produce as we break down foods. So it's the, um, it's the connection of uh, passageways that run from the tip of your nose, the nares or nasal uh, or your nostrils is the other word, uh, back through the pharynx, the back of your throat into uh, the opening of the larynx where your vocal folds are that make our, that allow us to have a voice into the trachea through the larger breathing passages in the lung, the bronchi out into the lungs themselves. And those air passages continue to uh, become finer and finer so that in the very deepest recesses of the lungs, they're known as, uh, as bronchioles. And those bronchioles end up in small air sacs where the actual exchange of carbon dioxide and oxygen takes place. We're used to worrying in the 
you know, giving strong consideration to what the winter is like, um, especially uh, for the impacts it has on our health, especially people who have, uh, who have longstanding problems like asthma or other lung or heart conditions. What we especially think about is uh, things as mild as the common cold, progressing to laryngitis in which people typically have a sore throat and they have difficulty speaking, the character of the voice changes. In smaller children, children under one year, uh, under five years of age, uh, there is this condition known as croup in which inflammation of the larynx by a virus produces this characteristic barking seal cough. A child will be talking to you and all of a sudden pause and cough. <coughs> and it'll have this very hoarse sound to it. And that too is, is just inflammation in the respiratory tract. Now, when a viral infection extends further um, below the vocal folds, it can do things like worsen the chronic bronchitis that older adults have, particularly those who have had lung injury due to smoking or other conditions and which they are bringing up sputum every day. The kind of person that wakes up with the morning cough, well, that cough is gonna be just that much worse and they may not be able to fully clear it during the day so that the cough may continue. We worry in the winter about influenza, which produces uh, a number of the symptoms I've described, but also brings with it fever, fatigue, and uh, a normal part of influenza, a common part of it is coughing in which you're bringing up phlegm. You're trying to clear your lungs of these secretions. Now, if we don't do testing, you don't have specific testing, it's hard to tell which virus a person might have producing this onset of lung disease that, or one of these other, um, one of these other conditions. And um, so when somebody has an influenza-like illness where they're coughing up sputum and they have a sore throat and a fever, the CDC, the Center for Disease Control, classifies these as influenza-like illnesses, IOI. So if you go online, you will find IOI used a great deal because uh, uh, it's used to, you know, reflect, uh, to recognize the uncertainty we often have in a precise diagnosis. The, uh, the most significant of the respiratory tract infections is when you have a well-established infection out in the tissue of the lung itself, which as I said, is where all those fine air sacs are that we depend on for what the lungs need to do, which is to give us oxygen and allow us to get rid of that carbon dioxide. And so these are the, you know, the, the things that, these are the conditions that get discussed when talking about winter respiratory tract disease. Probably the most feared of all of these are the one that historically has been uh, of the greatest concern is influenza. Influenza existed before the 20th century, but in the early part of the last century, we had this worldwide 1918 to 1920 epidemic. It gets referred to as the Spanish flu, but it didn't actually start in Spain. It began here in the United States in Kansas. And in the first month that this epidemic was, uh, this, um, this outbreak took place, 195,000 people died in the United States. And from there, it began to spread through the world, producing ultimately about 500 million cases and 10 to 50 million deaths. It's, and it it's, can be difficult to estimate the cause of death specifically due to influenza in the middle of a war. And by the way, the name, it was given the name Spanish flu, not because it started there or that it was worse there, but because in the middle of of World War I, there was a lot of restriction in what the US and the allies um, and the uh, allied forces um, with how they would talk about uh, the degree of which any illness was present at home or among troops. But it was, uh, it really took a lot of lives. It's been described as taking as many in, the, in some countries as uh, the, the war itself. Um, so you see these images then that create this, um, um, that help you realize just the impact, a sudden onset of disease that, uh, of the respiratory tract due to influenza virus that overwhelmed the ability of hospitals domestically to be able to keep up with cases. And you ended up these makeshift um, infirmaries to take care of the large number of patients. 
So influenza is probably the best example we had and until recently of how a, a virus can have, can initiate in a small area and then spread across um, an entire country and across an entire society. Influenza did this because, does this, because it has a short incubation period and because it produces, a, a, an, a, an individual has a lot of virus um, in their secretions once they become infected and, and the illness has, has gotten up at some speed. It, it essentially means that you can have one person who then doesn't even know that they're just about to begin to cough, but already uh, who is already shedding the virus, give it to others. And then those give it to others and you get this explosive increase in cases. Um, we in the United States have, uh, have taken this very seriously for decades, uh, especially since uh, the emergence of uh, having ability to, to deal with it has meant that we have tried to use influenza immunization to control the annual number of cases. Nonetheless, in the 30 years, um, uh, the first 30 years of really being very vigorous about using vaccines, we, we were, for influenza, we were seeing several thousand to up to 50,000 deaths every single year, every single season. And during those early years, we began to realize elderly and, and young children, especially infants, young children meaning under 24 months of age, but especially those in the first year age, um, were, were really being hit the hardest. But of course, we know that influenza really took a back seat to COVID-19 when it came along. And I, for this slide, I just pulled some of the graphs from the LA County De um, Department of Public Health to remind us of what we've been through since early 2020, we have had a steady number of cases shown up in the top with um, especially a, a large peaks when Delta emerged in late 2020 and heading into 2021. And then Omicron in 2021 that has now carried all the way over into well into this year. Um, the greatest uh, number of deaths that we saw was with Del the expansion of Delta and hospitals getting overwhelmed. Um, and where we currently stand is we're seeing a slight increase as we uh, end this year. We're getting into what, what looks like it may be a smaller surge, but nonetheless a surge. Overall then, where COVID has taken us is for it to become the third leading cause of death in the last two years, in 2020 to 21, the last two years that we have for which we have statistics. And it looks like it's gonna remain somewhere near the top as we head uh, towards the end of 2022. In, in, and the reason I said, well, COVID kind of made us less concerned and worried about influenza is because of the peculiarity that we saw in 20, the winter of 2020 to 2021. Instead of having hundreds of thousands of hospitalizations as we had had for decades going back, I, I just started, I put this chart together using data beginning with uh, um, the first three years before COVID where we had these many hundreds of thousands of, in, of uh, hospitalizations. Look what happened in 2020. We had almost no reports at all of influenza anywhere in the United States. And that's likely because it, it's, it's certainly thought to be due to the fact that uh, we were now so isolated in, at the end of that first year. And there was a great deal of adherence to the recommendations to wear a mask and to use alcohol-based hand rubs to maintain our distance. And it wasn't just influenza, other conditions um, also decreased in frequency, but influenza all but disappeared. Last year, we had a resurgence of some cases. And this year, we're on our way to having what would be a more typical season, unfortunately. The number of cases in the first, um, in, since we first, influenza was first detected and circulating in large numbers two months ago is already back up to, um, it looks as though it's ramping up the way it would in a typical year. In fact, um, when you look at CDC's map of where the greatest activity is, only seven states have more has a higher fraction of people that are turning up test positive for influenza. And so California sh uh, shaded in the brown here is only exceeded by the purple states uh, which have gotten ahead of us. But um, this comes at a time 
when we also have these other respiratory virus concerns. Bringing it home more locally, we, uh, the, uh, the California Weekly Report on Respiratory Virus Infections show us that um, the, most of the state is, is categorized as having a high level of hospitalizations and a high level of, of reports of illness. In the last week that was reported, numbers were still going up 4.3%. There had been 57 deaths in the state and 22 separate clear-cut outbreaks that had occurred. Uh, and it isn't, I, I don't know why this is the case, but at the moment, um, we are better off than the southernmost counties in California that have still uh, a still higher level of virus activity than what we're currently seeing. Okay, so I've tried to just set the stage on where we have been this year, where we've been the last couple of years. Let me pause for a second and see if you have any questions about uh, about this part so far, um, about uh, COVID and and where we've been and any of the you know the changing characteristics of it. I'll wait a minute and see if anything shows up in the chat. And I, by the way, I can't see chat, so somebody will have to relay questions to me. No worries, Dr. Krog. Sad there. Oh, we don't have anything in the chat just yet. Okay, fine. So I'll move on to the next slide. So, um, so here's our new challenge. Um, for the year for this winter, one we haven't seen in the last couple of years, and that is an increase in respiratory syncytial virus activity. Tried to, I've tried to give you an idea what it produces and when it usually, and that it is a winter virus, but it's doing, what we're seeing is, is unprecedented, um, especially here on the West Coast of the United States. When uh, in seeing such a large surge, and in particular the timing. Look at this slide. This shows you how uh, things have gone for the previous four years. Uh, so, this is a cycle of the uh, beginning of uh, the end of fall and the beginning of winter leading up until, so it goes in a cycle back into September, not, um, where fall is coming to an end. Look at the red dots, look at the purple dots. You'll, and you'll see that the peak time for respiratory syncytial virus cases, RSV cases, is typically early January. And we really seldom see much before um, early December. Uh, last year was a little bit different in the green, but, but now let's uh, see what we, uh, now you, you can see what's happening this year, that we started seeing a, a marked increase in cases first week of October. And in fact, the peak um, is now at a rate of four hospitalizations per 100,000 for this year, which matches 2019, which was a pretty, uh, which was a pretty heavy year for RSV. We've already hit that. And um, that, um, and and so that's in particular why we're hearing so much about RSV. Uh, the COVID may be slightly slowed down, but RSV is certainly there in, in large amounts, and that uh, obviously puts a burden on our healthcare system. So back. To, so now I'll focus a bit more on RSV. What it is? What are the? What are the most concerning manifestations of it? Um, how it can be prevented and um, what we should expect looking forward to, for things to get better, just as they have for COVID. For COVID, we now have vaccines, we understand the transmission pattern, we have good tests, and uh, we're much the same place with RSV, except for having good treatments. So what is it? RSV is a virus that is capable of causing disease in both the upper and the lower respiratory tract. In most children, adolescents and adults, it causes sore throat, um, runny nose, giving the appearance of a, a, of a common cold, croup that I uh, tried to imitate early on. Um, it, it is an important trigger of asthma attacks in young children. It is also a cause of pneumonia, but generally only in young children and severely immunocompromised people. Um, when, when we're talking about the age bracket, let's say between five years of age and 65 years of age, this is kind of the list of findings that you see. How is it transmitted? It's a bit, it's a bit different from COVID, let's say, where uh, after some struggle, we realized that 
COVID uh, is transmitted by close contact. COVID is transmitted by droplet spread. Coughing and sneezing allows us to, uh, to toss water droplets at each other, have them land on surfaces that we can touch and accidentally inoculate ourselves. COVID, uh, the SARS coronavirus type two also can um, be spread by aerosols that can spread uh, some distance in the air. And some famous outbreaks that have occurred, for example, in, you know, uh, in uh, Washington state where a, a choir outbreak first demonstrated this. People singing loudly, even if spread apart, meant uh, was this, well, that, uh, a choir at that choir practice, uh, people that were keeping their distance still managed to transmit it pretty effectively to each other, resulting in a number of deaths at this one particular church. RSV is, sim uh, is, is less than that. RSV is largely close contact, fairly short distance droplets and, um, and on surfaces. Um, the droplets that land on surfaces, however, can um, the virus can remain uh, viable. It, it can it uh, it can be um, it can produce infections even if it's been allowed to sit on top of a surface in the process of drying for a number of hours. So it's um, and one other aspect that's also been well um, demonstrated is that it's very effective at producing infections when you touch your own face, especially people touching their eyes. A study done involving um, hospital nurses revealed that if they wore masks, they saw little difference in the number of cases. Wearing a mask didn't seem to reduce the number of infections that nurses had while wearing gowns and washing their hands to take care of patients. When they made goggles that covered the eyes and the mouth, now you saw this reduction. So apparently nurses and other caregivers were inoculating themselves by touching things and forgetting if they had to push their hair back or straighten their glasses or something. And there's enough of the virus and its secretions that it infects the tissues of the eye, the moist tissues of the eye, just as well as it would the tissues inside of the nose. So there, there are some nuances that are slightly different, but that we do have this, we have this great deal of knowledge about uh, how it's transmitted. Okay, what I just what I just mentioned is how this can how this works out for the average person in our society, but the um, but the persons that are different who are at greatest risk are those that are at the extremes of it, uh, of age, infants particularly. In, uh, in the first six months of age and their grandparents perhaps, who are 65 years of age and up. In infants, it is that those younger age infants that I mentioned, prematurely born infants in particular, infants who have chronic lung disease or certain kinds of heart disease, the child who's born with one of a number of varieties of heart defects or the child who's, who ends up needing help from mechanical ventilators uh, because they were born so prematurely the lungs were not fully developed. Importantly, cigarette smoke is a real risk factor for infants when they get exposed to RSV. That includes um, it, the exposure of the baby in utero because the mother has smoked during pregnancy. Household, household crowding is, often, is also a risk for infants who went home perfectly healthy after um, their birth, returning to the hospital due to acquisition of, of RSV infection at home. When you live in crowded circumstances, as, as many Angelinos do, uh, it creates the possibility that somebody who may be incubating the virus, thinking they have a mild cold, nonetheless accidentally ends up transmitting that uh, to the infant who gets in trouble with it. Um, older um, let's see, older, I went the wrong direction, there we go. Older adults, 65 and up, as I said, are, are particularly at risk from being infected with RSV as well. Two sort of distinct categories. Um, the bottom one I'll mention first, those who have chronic heart or lung disease. People who are in heart fail, who have chronic heart failure. Um, it, those that, in other words, those who are taking medication just help their heart pump more effectively. Um, those that have existing uh, heart disease, the, I mentioned, for example, the smoker who has chronic obstructive pulmonary disease and begins her day or his day 
by coughing up phlegm for, uh, for hours until they get themselves clear, if they do. Emphysema, those uh, who, uh, a condition that is also caused by cigarette smoking and other, and other exposures that end up damaging the lungs so that they, they really become um, hollowed out almost and less effective in exchanging oxygen and uh, carbon dioxide. So th those particular heart and lung conditions are a real risk. On the other hand, there's the uh, general description of the frail uh, adult um, that uh, comes into this. Frailty is a concept that's emerged in the last 10 to 20 years in medicine, that the accumulation of you know, injuries or illnesses that lead to general weakness or fatigue, lack of strength, these are the, uh, the, make it more difficult for, uh, for an elder person to begin to, or to be able to tolerate the sneezing and coughing and increased work of breathing that can come from having an RSV infection. So it's these extremes of uh, age that make a difference. Notice that this is uh, a little different from COVID um, where infants, especially those younger infants seldom uh, get into trouble. It really is, it's really quite unusual for the youngest of children to develop severe lung disease. But um, uh, um, while the, uh, the elderly uh, also have a high, um, do have trouble with uh, COVID, uh, of course, with a, um, with a mortality rate, a death rate that's been estimated prior to our having some of the antiviral medications, of as high as 80, as high as 15%, 85% getting through 15% mortality rate among those oldest of, of uh, adults. So let, let's go back to a little bit to how infants get into trouble with, uh, with RSV. Um, RSV is the main cause of bronchiolitis. Bronchial, remember bronchioles being those very, very small passageways that lead right to the air sacs. And the way that our lungs normally work is to pull uh, air all the way down into, through those bronchioles out to the, um, the little air sacs. The, the diaphragm muscle uh, um, tightens in our mid chest. It pulls downward, creating negative pressure inside the chest. It pulls uh, your, um, uh, the, the amount of pressure that's inside of the, your chest is lower than the outside. And so air flows through the trachea and the bronchi and down into the bron um, uh, through the bronchi to the bronchioles. And when we relax the diaphragm, the diaphragm and all the tissues around it go back to the position that they were before the lungs deflate like a balloon would. And the, uh, the breath um, that now contains uh, the exhalation that now contains more CO2 just flows passively outward in, um, into the back of the mouth and out the nose. When, you're, when we are small infants, all these air passages are very, very much smaller and the bronchioles are even smaller. And uh, what RSV does is cause an infection out in the ends of the bronchi, not only making them swollen, but also making them put out um, inflammatory material, increased amounts of mucus that plug up these alveoli. So now, uh, sorry, the uh, alveoli are the sacs where air uh, gas exchange goes on. So not only the alveoli end up filled with this, but you have the bronchioles themselves, the passageways being blocked. This produces respiratory distress in infants. Here's a, a, just a, a sketch of a, a child breathing normally. When you think about it, when you see a child, you see their chest move and not much attracts the eye. But on the other hand, if you have bronchiolitis, what you typically see are, are so-called intercostal retractions. Uh, the ribs, that's where the word costa comes from. And when the diaphragm has to pull down extra hard to try and pull air all the way through the bronchioles, there's that much more uh, negative pressure inside the chest. And so you're actually pulling the muscle tissue and the skin inward. And so you see these ridges, which is just um, all the skin and, uh, um, and other tissues being pulled 
in between the ribs. So this is where that the term intercostal comes from. And it is a classic sign, as you see in the sketch as well, of uh, increased work of breathing due to um, having some sort of blockage somewhere in the lower respiratory tract. I, what's also drawn here is a little bit of shading right below the edges of the ribs. That re gets referred to as subcostal um, uh, and retractions. And you see it in this photograph of a child as a, a little bit of shading because the, the skin is really being pulled uh, downward underneath the ribs because the child's diaphragm is pulling so hard. Now I'll show you examples of what this really looks like. It's uh, pictures are one thing, but I hope these videos will run and give you a sense of um, what, the, uh, what these really look like, these signs of respiratory distress. So this will start in a second. And the first thing I want you to look for is those intercostal retractions but then it'll show us some other derivatives. So here are the, here are the retractions in the, uh, when this starts, you'll see the retractions between the ribs, right? Especially like right in front of the elbow on, the, on his side. This child doesn't look overly distressed, but he is working harder to breathe. So the audio is not on on this, but notice how quickly this child is breathing and he's rocking so hard to be able to breathe. Um, this child is doing the same but he, he's actually making some really noisy, wheezy breathing because he has, um, um, he, because of swelling up in his throat. Now in this child, look up here at his nose and you'll see that he um, has uh, this condition called nasal flaring where his nostrils are opening up. And this child is, um, sh is uh, showing you um, sternal retractions where he's actually, pulling it down so hard with the diaphragm that the, uh, the sternum is moving in. Sternum is, is made entirely of cartilage and, uh, for a number of months after birth. And so you can really see it flex when he's sucking in the air so hard. I'll show you one other video of this. And with this child, before I, when I start it, make sure you look at his nostrils and then look at the subcostal retractions as well and how fast he's breathing. Here we go, nose and underneath the ribs. So you can see him spreading the nostrils. You can see him sucking in down here underneath the ribs. May even be able to see a little bit of the, yeah, sucking between the ribs. So this, these are, and the, the respiratory rate here is, I should have counted it before, but it's, it's certainly faster than 60. And where 60 is the, is the usual maximum uh, respiratory rate for any child. All right, so that's what RSV looks like in the small child. Um, and which you've already gotten a hint of from looking at the, um, from some of the other pictures I showed is that the problem is that they're not able to get enough oxygen in. So when you put one of those little pulse oximeter devices on the finger that measures how saturated with oxygen the blood is, you'll find that they're at a, such a low level that it, it does produce a feeling of distress in the infant and can make the, the body work harder just to, um, to be able to, to per, uh, do the normal things that it needs to do, including uh, trying to feed with a low oxygen level in your blood. That typically will make infants very uncomfortable. Um, but then let's talk about that, adults for a second. Uh, oh, and, and uh, that's what I was, I know what I was going to mention, I'm sorry. I was going to mention that when a child gets uh, hospitalized, it's um, the, the key thing is just maintaining high enough level, uh, providing extra oxygen if it is needed for the child and making sure that they can, uh, they're getting enough fluids in if they're breathing so hard that they're practically choking while trying to uh, breathe. Now let's talk about RSV in the elderly for a second. Here, I don't have the same sorts of pictures. The numbers I think those speak loads. I, I mentioned that, for, um, that bronchiolitis is the most severe, uh, um, is, the, is the most common and severe impact on children. And uh, so they end up being hospitalized. 58,000 hospitalizations is typical for an average year and they're all younger children. And uh, we do see some deaths, unfortunately, despite um, the, the advanced therapies that now can be provided for a child that's in real distress, a few hundred deaths per year. But look at what happens annually in the elderly. 
um, hundreds of thousands of hospitalizations and on the order of 14,000 deaths. Um, uh, so that we're talking about, instead of it being one in a thousand ch uh, children who dies, we're talking about this being um, more on the order of one in 10 or one to 15. So RSV is a very bad actor. It's a, it really is a danger to frail and sick elderly persons. So that's what, uh, that's why we're so concerned about these uh, increases in RSV cases. So let me just return for a moment in two slides to answer the question, are, are we really in a triple demic? I, you know, as soon as RSV was being talked about, right away that term emerged. Is it, uh, so is it really a problem? Well, how great a problem is it? Um, here are the statistics for Los Angeles County for the, like, the last six months. I, these, this uh, chart picks up in June, and you'll see that the number of cases has been relatively small compared to where we were like two years ago. But we're still talking about having um, approximately 3,000 new cases um, per day over the last couple of weeks. As of yesterday, there were about 1,251, I think the number was, uh, people hospitalized with COVID in the, uh, in the Los Angeles County. So that already is, is a burden that we didn't have before, taking that many people who, uh, who get hospitalized, it's almost all adults and they almost all require respiratory support. So right away you have the number of nurses, respiratory technicians and ICU staff in some cases taking care of these individuals. So that's what we have right now is 1200 uh, cases there. When you look at uh, the, uh, what, um, what's happening in LA County with influenza, it took off at about the same time that RSV did. Here's the, um, here's the RSV curve and, um, uh, no, sorry, this is both influenza. The RSV curve, I remember showing you that it started at about um, week 42 to 44 and it had already reached a peak. So this is influenza and influenza this year is doing the same thing. It's on, I, I don't, just because the, this is partial reporting for the week, um, the newer report is likely to show that when you complete the week, that we're going to that we're still heading for the top of our influenza season. And um, the reports, uh, typically, the major thing to keep in mind is that for a usual um, influenza season, like you see here for 27, 2018, this goes on for months. So now we have three different causes. Uh, of severe respiratory infection that are out there simultaneously. And part of what's going on differently here is that we have so many RSV cases at the same time affecting both adult, uh, the elderly and the children at the same time that we had just the baseline level of influenza and, uh, and COVID that even involves middle-aged middle -age people, people that are in uh, their teens to 65 years of age, normally the healthiest part of one's lifespan. So we, um, our healthcare system is currently pressed by this and we're in a position where we have many more hospitals relative to the number of people, unlike rural areas in the United States. So it's easy to see where we're worried. And um, in particular, um, as a pediatrician, what we're seeing in Los Angeles County is that all the uh, all three children's hospitals in the area are kind of running at capacity of, of what they, uh, the number of children they can handle. Children's Hospital Los Angeles has the most pediatric beds um, on the order of 500. Um, uh, the Mattel Children's Hospital at, um, at UCLA has, I think our number is something like 150, including ICU beds. And we have, uh, UCLA has been at its maximum bed capacity for children on and off for most of the last month. I get these pages in the morning at, that like all the other faculty do indicating whether or not, uh, you know, whether we have beds available to admit anybody else. And, and we've been getting those warnings that we're maxed out and until others are discharged, we won't be able to take any other uh, patients at all. And the ICUs have often been running at capacity as well. Miller Children's in Long Beach reporting the same thing. So 
this RSV is in fact is affecting healthcare in Los Angeles just as it is as is being talked about in other major cities across the US. What can we do about that? Well, we, we can, uh, it's always best to prevent what you can't make go away promptly. Um, if you can't treat it, make sure it doesn't happen. Is always the, especially if you can't treat it, it's better to prevent disease than it is to treat. Here's what you can, here's what we should all be doing. First, that we should be um, covering our coughs, you know, uh, uh, demonstrating good cough hygiene, not just coughing out loud or sneezing out loud. Better to not sneeze into your, into your hands or cough into your hands because then you've now inoculated them. So whatever you touch, you're going to uh, be able to spread the virus about. Um, CDC suggests that using a tissue to cough into uh, to cough or sneeze into is better because at least that is rapidly disposable and lessens the chances that your hands are heavily contaminated. Don't have a tissue, don't have time. Coughing into the elbow, uh, into your own elbow is, is a way to kind of contain things. Um, but of course, then you should be washing your hands. Uh, hand washing with soap and water for at least 20 seconds is um, making sure that you get the touch surface is not just, you know, rubbing the middle of your hand, but the fingers, your thumbs, um, tops and backs of your hands for 20 seconds um, is, is how we should be doing it. And watching what we do once we finish washing our hands, like grabbing a paper towel um, and rubbing our hands using that paper towel to shut off the faucet if the water has to be shut off manually. Um, so washing is our second line of defense in terms of avoiding spreading these droplets around. Um, the um, uh, RSV doesn't exist anywhere else except in humans. So avoiding close contact to an extent um, is, is advised. This was the best picture I could find for somebody who looked like they were resisting close contact at the moment perhaps for a number of reasons, but nonetheless, uh, 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 close contact and you know, keeping some, uh, some distance from each other as we did in early COVID days is advisable if you're in contact, it's especially advisable if you're in contact with small children um, or with the elderly. Let's, let's just think about how easy this is to spread and the fact that we're in the middle of this surge in cases. And then avoiding sharing cups and utensils um, with other people. So there we go, my last picture. Better to have your own cup and your, um, and your own beverage kept separately. Um, so those are hygiene things mostly. What else um, can we do to prevent infections? It can be difficult uh, because of our sense of responsibility and the fact that we have to have jobs, but Staying at home from work or school when you're sick until the symptoms improve and you can really uh, control your own secretions at the very least. You're not having episodes of sneezing and coughing. Uh, that um, is, is, an important, um, is an important consideration. Also, frequently touched surfaces should be frequently cleaned. This includes doorknobs in your own home, let alone um, you know, uh, surfaces where you work where other people may come in contact with them. Um, keeping infants under one year of age out of daycare during the RSV season is recommended by CDC. And I recognize that that can be a very uh, difficult for families who have to have to, uh, have to have a job. I mean, have to work to keep uh, food on the table and keep, um, keep a roof over their heads and where even days make a difference. Um, nonetheless, uh, for those who somehow can work out a different daycare kind of situation, avoiding larger daycares um, um, where, um, or uh, avoiding situations where the children go in and out and uh, because uh, where you have a different population maybe every day. Smaller daycares, in-home daycare centers may be, be, uh, may be better uh, in some cases at preventing exposure to RSV. How do we treat RSV? Well, you treat the symptoms mostly. Um, keep the nose of infants free of secretions using one of the blue rubber bulbs. 
I guess they come in other colors. I always see the blue ones. Um, uh, but uh, using that to aspirate the secretions to make it easier for the infant to breathe because so much of their breathing occurs through the nose. Monitor and treat fevers, a temperature of 100.4 or 38.3 or more um, is, is considered a fever by most pediatricians. Um, use acetaminophen, aspirin, should, uh, which is Tylenol and other brands of acetaminophen. Aspirin should not be given to children ever. Aspirin, um, just to restate this, um, because it, it, it's become less of an issue. There are so few aspirin products, but aspirin when mixed with influenza and some other respiratory viruses can produce this condition known as Rye syndrome um, that uh, can be fatal to younger children. When aspirin was taken, aspirin containing products were taken off of, uh, to, out of the list of medications we use for children. Um, this has all but gone away, it, but it would be easy to restart by, uh, for, to see cases of it again if we used aspirin. Now, decongestants, and decongestants like pseudofedrin and other cold medications are not recommended for children. And in, in particularly, RSV is where they could cause the most harm. Um, the children who get in the most trouble with RSV are those with heart and lung conditions and speeding your heart up to an even higher rate when you're ill um, can, uh, can actually be dangerous for children who have certain kinds of heart conditions. Adding antihistamines, which are uh, to a giving antihistamines to a child, and that's what's largely in these cold medications, will dry up their secretions and make it tougher to keep the airways open. So we uh, so the general recommendation is control fever if it's there. Um, um, avoid any other medications that are just aimed at trying to uh, address the secretions. That will have to run itself out, uh, run its run its time, which is typically less than a week. Um, and keep the ch uh, the child hydrated uh, by continuing feedings and offering additional water. Encourage uh, the same thing applies for adults who should be encouraged to drink extra fluids to maintain their state of hydration. There are no specific medications that have an effect on RSV. Uh, antibiotics have no effect. Um, there are no antiviral medications that, uh, that have been developed for another, any other kind of virus that would work. We simply at present have no antiviral medications. I probably should have put this slide in early to say there is a strategy. There are strategies for preventing that are medication based. Uh, we don't have vaccines yet, but a number have been, uh, are, have been tested and are under testing now. A successful trial was recently published in the New England Journal of Medicine showing this, uh, the, uh, the effectiveness of a vaccine for pregnant women so that they would produce antibodies instead of getting cold symptoms. Um, and that those antibodies would then cross over the blood uh, into the infant's bloodstream and protect them from serious illness in the first six months of life. So um, it, we have used that strategy as being used now um, for two other uh, diseases right away. Our tetanus shots, the tetanus shots that we all get protect against a condition that I've not seen here. I've only seen in Jamaica, uh, only seen in Haiti, which is tetanus in newborns where an infection produces a toxin that can be paralyzing. So one, a, a, uh, an important aspect of public health in all countries is the use of tetanus vaccine for everyone, not only to protect them, but in the case of women of childbearing age, that protects their infants from acquiring, um, uh, the, from, from developing tetanus, just by coming in contract with the toxin producing bacterium. We also do this with whooping cough, with pertussis vaccines. We immunize, uh, the current standard in the United States is to immunize a, uh, a woman at the end at the end of each pregnancy, to, uh, because uh, so that if she has other pregnancies in the years uh, in the next year to two years ahead, while the vaccine is still providing protection, it reduces the risk that the child will have um, pertussis in the first six months of life. The mortality rate can be very high um, in newborn infants because of the injury to the lungs. They simply cannot breathe while 
going through the hacking or repeated cough that is typical of pertussis. So by developing RSV vaccines, we may be able to, uh, to make finally a dent in the number of annual cases that occur in, um, in young children in the United States. But what about those adults? There are trials ongoing uh, uh, vaccines to, tr uh, to prevent RSV infections in the elderly. I myself am volunteering for one such trial that has been going for a number of months and um, you know, hopefully we'll have data out by next year showing whether or not it, it was successful. Um, so progress is being made on the vaccine front. The other, uh, there is a one kind of long acting protection, um, preventative, um, uh, preventative medication that, is, uh, that can be used for infants. And that's uh, the use of monoclonal antibodies. The one called Synergis or palibizumab is it, it's like those COVID antibodies that you've heard of where you get an injection and it will protect you if you encounter the virus itself. Um, the, uh, uh, there have also been COVID antibodies that could be given during, um, right as a person becomes ill to block, um, uh, to, and so that it acts as a treatment medication. Unfortunately, those have, um, are no longer effective in the case of COVID because the virus has changed so much. But Synergis has been around for on the order of 25 years and it remains effective. The only problem with it is that it is, um, it, it, uh, is that it has to be given once monthly. So a premature infant who leaves the hospital will be started on this. If, um, if they had any need for extra oxygen while they were in the hospital and they would need five monthly injections. That's the usual duration of a, of a season. There is a second longer lasting monoclonal antibody that was just approved by the European uh, organization that is the counterpart of FDA. And the food and drug, US Food and Drug Administration uh, will probably be reviewing it soon um, the manufacturer of this long acting one shot per season monoclonal has recently begun to file the documentation required um, for FDA to approve it. Um, so things are going to get better as far, uh, oh, and I, there are also antiviral medications being studied for RSV, but so far the experience is too little. It's unclear how long it's going to take until we have access to a medication. We're, things are going at a bit slower pace than for COVID. Now, going back to RSV, how can you help? First, share your knowledge and not the virus. Be a model for effective prevention. Show, you know, enforcing, I didn't mention hand washing, uh, sorry, uh, mask wearing uh, for RSV, but it makes good sense to do so as part of the, um, the the triple demic that we are in fact facing um, with COVID and influenza and RSV, uh, decreasing the chances that if we have it, we won't uh, spread it around and that if someone else has it, we won't pick it up and then help spread it around. Um, so mask wearing can play a role in, RS in, in RSV as well. Um, hand washing and cough hygiene are the, the things that we can do multiple times per day that decrease the likelihood of the spread of this virus. Second, I think it's important, for example, those of you who are home visitors to have a sense of what respiratory distress looks like in an infant. The adults can tell you that they feel short of breath and that it's so hard to breathe and that the coughing or sneezing that they're going through is really making it difficult for them to feel comfortable. Infants cannot. So recognizing the rapid breathing, the retractions, um, persistent coughing, those things that are, you come with RSV, uh, uh, knowing that, that uh, having that information in hand can help you uh, teach others about it and recognize it when you see it and, and encourage people to seek medical help for their child. Um, also, you can help, help uh, your clients identify sources of information that are trustworthy. The American Academy of Pediatrics, as an example, the Center for Disease Control, and the LA Department of Public Health all have websites 
that provide uh, fact-based, long um, and, and uh, multilingual um, sources of information. So coming to the end then, I'll just say, that I'll go through what I said I was going to discuss and what we were, and just sum up quickly. We talked, uh, I wanted to talk about how RSV is a perennial public health threat. And, and the key points are it, it uh, affects the upper lower and worse, the lower respiratory tract disease, causing disease mostly in young infants, especially those under six months, and in older people beginning at about 65 years of age, especially those who have lung conditions or are in general, general poor, poor health that have become frail. Uh, the, str uh, the strategies for RSV prevention are your personal hygiene, and then thinking about the, uh, the environment around you, uh, avoiding contact, that uh, close contact that um, can produce a transmission of infection and keeping areas where people congregate cleaned. Um, Alcohol-based hand rough, by the way, works very effectively. Soap and water works very effectively on surfaces. Bleach works very effectively. R RSV is a very easy virus uh, to clean up after. Um, I mentioned just the supportive measures that are involved in teaching, hydration, um, keeping the na nasal passages of children clear, monitoring for signs of respiratory distress, and then sharing the useful sources of information that, that uh, I just mentioned. And in, in particular, I was gonna show you the RSV um, uh, page at Center for Disease Control. Each of the purple um, uh, little panels down headed, the headings are um, on, uh, and each of these cases are followed at the bottom by um, hot links that you can click on. And the information is really terrific um, that, uh, that is provided. It's, it, it's um, available in Spanish, it is as well as English, and it's written in a way that avoids overdoing it with the medical language. Um, LA County Public Health Department similarly has an English and Spanish language sources of information that are just crystal clear. Um, they, uh, you know, they avoid the excessive language that uh, can get into long pamphlets, et cetera. Uh, American Academy of Pediatrics also has a web page under its healthychildren.org um, title. And it has similarly good sources of information. They, you know, I, po I point out over here on the right that they have a little cartoon um, on the, uh, uh, a video that using cartoon faces uh, allows you to kind of um, experience what uh, respiratory distress look like in, in an infant without necessarily looking at uh, being distressed by looking at uh, videos of sick children. So that is where I will leave it. I'm into my extra slides and um, I'll be happy to try and answer any questions that you have. And thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Dr. Krogstad. Can we all give him a warm round of applause through the reactions or in the chat? We got a lot of good feedback. Um, there was a question for you, um, Dr. Krogstad. Um, when you were discussing the treatments, um, Veronica Flores asked, um, when is Synergist used? I believe you covered a little bit on it, but if you can, just for the audience to clarify kind of when it is used in, in this instance. Sure. Um, Synergist, as I mentioned, is a monoclonal, um, and uh, it's a very small injection. Uh, it is not, um, it's an intramuscular injection. And uh, what's great about monoclonals is the volumes are very small. They're a very concentrated, uh, highly pure medication. The, they are expensive. And there has been a lot of discussion about um, when you should begin using synergists, uh, when physicians should be uh, start distributing it. Um, the American Academy of Pediatrics sets uh, the standards on that um, and has in its guidelines um, a recommendation that uh, of who precisely it's been, uh, well, it, it lists, um, the types of heart conditions, for example, and the types of lung disease, who is at really greatest risk when we, when we really drill down and look at, at uh, the health conditions that make you at greatest risk. Okay, so 
the season is normally five months long. This year, um, we'll see how it runs out. Starting early um, may mean that March will be the end of it, when in fact, we would typically get to the end of April. And so it's one injection per month. And um, it's the CDC or local health departments that really, by monitoring what occurs locally, indicate to the uh, indicate to physicians practicing in the area um, that it is time to you know we're the, the monitoring of cases of RSV has shown there's enough activity that we will begin to see cases in children because you usually pick up RSV first not in the infants you pick it up in adults or in older children who are getting testing uh, to try and identify the cause of uh, a viral illness so four or five doses a a year. The timing in Los Angeles is different than that in Florida. Florida runs a longer season that usually starts earlier. In LA, we would not, uh, I don't remember seeing the synergists being given before mid-December in, in previous years, but here we already had cases starting in October. So I think uh, UCLA, for example, started in mid-October. It's really data driven, though, it, um, that if for some reason, um, well, um, they, we weren't seeing cases of RSV uh, in October, November, December, we would just be sitting with the stocks of it available until it really became clear that it was beginning to spread. So I, I can't even tell you right now how, uh, whether it will be five doses, five monthly doses this year, or if it'll go longer because COVID has. Uh, shaking things up a little bit and, be, and um, in terms of the normal seasonalities. We don't know why this early surge is going on with RSV. So that was an example of my giving a five minute question to a 30 second, an uh, a five minute answer to a 30 second question. The answer is five doses is, is usually it beginning with when there's increased disease activity that's been detected by public health authorities. Great, thank you so much. And um, we have another question in regards to that. Of, yes. It was, what is the age recommendation for Synergis? Yeah, Synergis is uh, given almost, um, it's seldom given beyond the first year of life. And the reason for that, I say it that way, is a child, uh, it usually have some, uh, it isn't the health, uh, it isn't, um, I, I kind of listed some of these risk factors and premature infants get in more trouble um, than um, infants who are born in term. Um, people with heart disease of certain kinds um, also have trouble with RSV. And, um, but um, yes, you do see um, term newborns who uh, will just develop a significant, a serious infection. So, but not usually two seasons in a row. You can, children will often get um, uh, a second RSV infection the next year. Um, the, it's just as we have seen with COVID-19 that the immunity that you get from one infection doesn't last forever. It's not like, um, it's not like uh, measles, for example, where if you get measles, um, a ser very serious disease for, um, for some um, who get pneumonia or encephalitis, but most, um, but all people who get measles one time are protected if, they, if their immune system is anything resembling normal. With infants, what happens, uh, uh, it's more with infants with RSV, it's more like COVID that you're protected for the remainder of the season. If you get RSV, you quit, we quit giving Synergis shots because the body's response to Synergis in that season is enough to prevent a subsequent infection. They won't run into another infant and get it back again. But, uh, and then the subsequent year, they, will, uh, get an, uh, they may get an infection, but it, it isn't generally serious at all. So in, it, it's in general, you're gonna see Synergis used in the first or maybe the second year of life, depending on the infant's circumstances. Synergis is occasionally used for other 
very sick children as well. Like somebody who's gone through a bone marrow transplant, a child who has um, had a solid organ transplant, like uh, a liver transplant or a heart transplantation procedure, they will get it. And, and that may be when they're um, significantly older. But yeah, Synergis is really a medication for the first year of life in the, uh, in the most vulnerable. Any other questions? Well, thank you very much for your attention. And I, and, um, I would appreciate any feedback in the comments. Uh, I, uh, this is my first time giving this kind of presentation to this kind of group. And uh, I did see at least one comment in the chat that the videos that I put in there were helpful. Um, it is very striking when you first see a child uh, that ill. And, and it's, um, you know, it's good to know that that those are symptoms that need to be attended to. Um, and if you have other, any other suggestions, I'd be happy to hear those as well. Thank you for your time. Yes. Thank you so much, Dr. Cox. Now, we do have one more question, if you yeah. could answer it. Um, with RSV in adults, does it look the same, like same signs and symptoms as it is in infants, for example, like the nose flaring and the sucking in of the ribs that you had previously mentioned? What does it look like if it's not the same? You may see nasal flaring, but the chest is not nearly so flexible in us because, you know, our, our ribs are now fully uh, solid bone. And um, we can, uh, at our size, we can't usually, uh, cannot usually do the intercostal retraction, but you may, you may in fact see it. Um, mostly what you'll see is the faster heart, uh, the faster breathing rate. Um, the um, um, the coughing that often goes with it, because I said uh, the the collection of secretions in the lungs and in the bronchi are what cause uh, people to have more difficulty. A feeling of shortness of breath because of uh, because of all this difficulty in breathing is what people will report. But it's you know it's you know, it's mostly seeing people maybe rock their shoulders as they try to open up their chest the same way that uh, when a baby uh, decrease, pulls his diaphragm down to try and just get uh, pull harder to get air into it. So people will, will raise their shoulders, lean forward. Um, you see them positioning themselves uh, to try and just take bigger, deeper breaths. Um, but mostly they will, um, a conscious person, if you uh, will, um, may have difficulty breathing and therefore even have difficulty reporting to you that they feel short of breath, but uh, it's uh, it's looking for the focus on breathing that is uh, going to be the major symptom. Plus, how fast they're breathing. Great, thank you. Um... Thank you all everyone for coming again and um, just give another warm welcome to a um, warm welcome a warm thank you to Dr. Krogstad for all this information. It was truly um, very informational to see all the data and things like that with RSV both in infants and, and the elderly. So it was it was great to see all of this and, and be able to understand and look for these types of signs and symptoms. So thank you so, so much for everything that you've presented to us. I'm sure that the network all feels the same very much with all the information that you have brought to us. If there are any other questions, um, please feel free to reach out to us.